Dear professors, dear TAs, and dear classmates, my name is Omid Rizani. In the next few slides that you're going to see, I'm going to talk about the walls of thermodynamics, but within the context of the protein folding inside a biological cell. But what's going to be the problem? We are going to talk about the laws of thermodynamics in order to see how a linear sequence of amino acids, which is going to be the primary structures of the protein, is going to be folded into a stable structure, which is going to be a folded structure at the tertiary ones, that it becomes structurally uh, functional inside the cell. But all the things that you're going to learn, it's not going to be specific for the protein folding. You can also take it to the protein ligand binding, which is a hot topic research in either drug designs or also medicinal, I should say, chemistry. At the end of this presentation, you're going to see that finding the optimal form of the structures of a protein is not a huge mystery, I should say. It's essentially, it comes down to the problem of optimization. And essentially, we're going to define the Gibbs energy which we have seen that on different modules of the book, we're going to find the Gibbs free energy uh, in, I should say, in the energy surface. And now we are just going to optimize it to find the minimum one and the steepest distance of, I should say, the energy surface. And that point essentially shows, I should say, the native state or the structurally stable folded protein. And now it starts from an unfolded state which is a linear sequence of the amino acids, then we minimize it on the energy surface to find the minimal, I should say, of the free, I should say, gives energy, which it's related to the native state of the protein. But within the biological context, it's going to be a little bit tricky because that way we are not looking for a global, I should say, minimization. That's not a global search by a protein. The protein has a very smart and tricky way not to go all the, I should say, in high dimension search for the minimal one. We are going to talk about that smart way of the biological cells also. But why protein folding is going to be very important? Why? Because, for example, some of the neurodegenerative diseases, like the Alzheimer which shows, I should say, some neural atrophy at the prefrontal cortex of the brain, or somehow the temporal ones, which leads to the dementia, essentially is a result of the protein misfolding of a very important protein of the, in the body, which is called amyloid beta. In the Alzheimer's disease, the protein amyloid beta is not going to be properly folded. It's misfolded. It's the confirmation which it takes is not what is going to be structurally suitable for its function. Then when, age, when people age, essentially they fight against the laws of the thermodynamics. One day, I should say, alpha uh, amyloid beta protein, which they have, gets misfolded. And they just becomes, I should say, grouped in some parts of the t neural tissue, which you see that the histology of the brain slide of someone who has been diagnosed with the Alzheimer, and you see that the amyloid beta, when they get misfolded, they conglomerate on one part of, I should say, the cell. And the protein, as I said, it's amyloid beta. It's normally, it has uh, 36, around 43 amino acids. And if you wonder what is an amino acid, I have a quick reminder for you that amino acids is, I should say, there is an alpha carbon there, which is attached to four different groups. The carboxyl group, the amino group, a hydrogen, and more importantly, the side chain. The side chain, which is going to be very important into the protein folded, because depending on the nature of the side chain, either it's going to be polar, it's going to be charged electrically, or it's going to be, I should say, neutral, it plays a crucial role in the protein folding structure after it's synthesized, I should say, in the nucleus, uh, in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, now. In order to just answer how the protein is going to be folded, we are going to talk about with the free, I should say, Gibbs energy. We know that it has two different parts. The Gibbs energy has two parts. The first part is going to be enthalpy of the formation, which essentially relates to the formation or disassociation of the bonds, either ionic or covalent bonds. And also, we are going to talk about the organization, I should say, energy, which is a product of the temperature into the entropy of the cell. Then we have two drivers that decides on the folding process of the protein. 
But, and also, we are looking at the protein folding at two different perspectives. The first one is going to be as a kind of a reactant, which is going to be the unfolded concentration of the proteins. And the product is going to be the folded concentration of the proteins. And definitely, we are looking for the case that the Gibbs free energy is going to be a negative one, which shows that the energy, which shows that the protein folding is going to be a spontaneous process. Because we are not expecting to have the protein after its synthesis, that there should be an external push to have it folded inside the cell. We want it, optimally, this process to be spontaneous. And now, as I said, we are looking, you have two drivers of the protein folding. Either it's going to be enthalpy of the formation, or either it's going to be, I should say, uh, the entropy, which is, we call that the product of the temperature, which we call that, um, I should say, uh, the organization energy. For the enthalpy, we are looking, just looking at the electrostatic interactions between, I should say, the components with the atoms of that structure. And now, what do I mean? For example, the side chains of the atom in the amino acids, they can interact either by, I should say, by the hydrogen bound between the hydrogen and the oxygen or the nitrogen of the side, I should say, of the neighboring atoms. For example, in the alpha helix or beta sheets, which are the secondary structures of the protein, hydrogen bound is crucial. And you know that the hydrogen bound, if that's going to happen, it's entalpically, this is favorable for us. And also, sometimes when the side chain just gets close, close to each other, they have some kind of transient polars, dipodes, that they also, electrostatically, they interact with each other. Then, then so far, we talked about the enthalpy of formation of the bounds of the protein, I should say, folding. And now I'm going to talk about the entropy. Normally for the proteins, the entropy, it's going to be selected in a way, the formation is going to be selected in a way that the entropy is going to be maximized. Because if the entropy is maximized, we know that the organization energy essentially is the subtraction of the enthalpy minus, I should say, the organization energy. Then that way, if entropy is maximized, we have the Gibbs free energy is decreased. Then now, the hydrophobic effect, which is collapsing of the side chain of the amino acids internally and inwardly in order to avoid the hydrogen bounds of the water or the solvent, it plays a huge role in the decrease of the entropy of the amino acids because now they have a collection of fewer conformation that they can adapt to but at the same time that's compensated with the increase of the entropy of the water which is going to be an increase in the entropy of the universe in that solution but the thing which is going to be very interesting to talk about is that imagine that we have an amino acid chain it has at least nine, I should say, degrees of freedom because it can be identified by three different sets of the angles, psi, phi, and omega. And imagine that if you have an amino acid chain, which it has 150 amino acids, then you can have 10 to the power of 150 confirmations that the protein can just rotate around its angles and give a distinctly different conformation in a folded structure. But the problem is that if the protein, just if the cell wants to spend time to globally search for the optimal folded structures among 150 but 10 to the power 150 confirmation, it takes billions, billions of the years. But what happens, cells normally do the folding between a fraction of a second, which is going to be either within the range of the picoseconds or microseconds. But how that's happened, how the cell decides, how the cell can just overcome that problem. And now we just come to this very interesting, I should say, theory that the folding pattern of the protein inside a biological cell, it has a recipe which is embedded inside, I should say, the domain of that amino acid sequences. Then the amino acid sequence also, it bears the code, the secret code, that how it has to be folded. Then the cells, they do not go through the global search to find the optimal folded structures, they know in advance what folded structure is going to be more suitable structurally and functionally for the cell. However, 
than when we just simulate this kind of folding process. For example, this one is a simulation using the multi corollary simulation, but for this one, as you can see, we always, as I showed that on the previous slides, we always come to the steepest distance to find the minimal point of the Gibbs free energy. But you, you learn that the cells, they have a much smarter, a kind of a trick not to go through using these high dimensions to search for the optimal minimal to find the folded structures. But before we end, I'm just going to ask you this very interesting question, that based on the things that you have learned thermodynamically, do you think that the protein misfolding can be an irreversible process or is a reversible process? That answer that you find for this question can be significant, I should say, advances in the science, specifically for Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease. What do you think thermodynamically? Protein misfolding is reversible or irreversible. And now we come to an end. I'd like to thank you very much for taking your time to listen to my presentation and have a very nice day.